This little video gives some background information about um, the discovery, um, particularly of human remains and the treatment of material goods found in Pompeii over the ages um, and leads up to a task um, which you have to try and unpick to explain the presence um, and the story behind um, certain um, remains found in one of the more spectacular houses of Pompeii, the House of Menander. This famous engraving from the 18th century gives us um, a, a good insight into um, some of the more unscrupulous tactics that early excavators got up to in the early days of excavation of Pompeii. Um, what we see here is the Emperor Joseph II of Austria visiting a house that was subsequently named after him in 1769. And um, so we're led to believe um, the, the body you can see there um, positioned dramatically in the shaft of sunlight was just unearthed in the moments before um, he happened to have entered the room. Um, as we can see um, from the, uh, the expression on the, uh, and the body language of the emperor on the left, he, he was not at all impressed by what he'd seen, although his wife in the middle seems to be more so. And he pretty much smelt a rat straight away. And his misgivings were subsequently proven. And it seems that um, this uh, body had been manipulated uh, in the moments before the emperor's visit to try and create a more dramatic scene um, leading up to the, the, you know, the very moments before uh, this poor unfortunate met his end. Um, and uh, no, by no means was this an isolated incident. And it's something else that we have to bear in mind with a certain caution when trying to interpret material remains in Pompeii that um, some, uh, as we mentioned, more unscrupulous excavators may have actually uh, manipulated the, the remains to make them look, as we mentioned, more accurate. Or in some cases, um, early looters would have just simply taken some of the more expensive material goods away for themselves. In a very similar vein to the previous slide, we see in this 18th century woodcut, um, very well-dressed um, gentlemen, um, possibly on their grand tour, being shown some of the ongoing excavations of Pompeii. Um, and in the background, we can see quite a lot of activity there. Um, it's not entirely clear what the three uh, towards the uh, on the left-hand side are up to. It may well be that they're um, uh, brushing away some of the encrusted debris from from a mosaic, from a wall wall painting. Or it could be, unfortunately, that they're actually uh, chipping away the plaster um, wholesale to take away either for a private collection or, or to a museum. But either way, um, what these uh, cuts show us is the non-scientific um, early methods that were sometimes employed, which actually led to quite a lot of destruction and loss um, because that wasn't really the priority um, at the time. Here's one of the most famous uh, figures ever attached to Pompeian archaeology. Giuseppe Fiorelli, an, uh, the director of excavations uh, in Pompeii um, for much of the uh, 19th century. Um, Fiorelli had a very colourful career and one of his uh, many contributions to forwarding the understanding of life in, in Pompeii uh, and for subsequent conservation and excavation um, is demonstrated on the left there. What we see um, is a, a citizen or a, uh, an unfortunate member of the public um, going about his business in Pompeii and succumbing to and the eruption. And over the course of years, his body is buried in uh, various layers of debris, ash, dust, pumice, uh, and so on. Um, and when um, excavators um, started to, to take away some of these layers, they began to find cavities um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the floor. And um, they very quickly understood that these cavities would have once contained um, organic remains, you know, humans that would have rotted away. Uh, and by filling in these bodies with um, uh, casts, plaster, resin, uh, and so on, um, they were able to um, subsequently chip away at the area of um, uh, the surface around it and, and um, in so doing preserve the shapes and attitudes of um, various uh, people, victims of the, the eruption. And in some cases they will have had, as you can see in that middle picture, complete skeletons preserved, which subsequently allows um, some pioneering DNA work to um, to, to really kind of find in greater details and more information about these people, who they were, where they came from, and so on. Um, Fiorelli's um, methods actually earned him uh, some time in prison. Um, he uh, got into some fairly uh, serious hot water with the king, Ferdinand II, who disapproved of, uh, disapproved of his methods of archaeology, and, and clearly there was more going on than just that. But either way, he was a political prisoner for a few years, and, and it's in those years that he uh, wrote up some of his methods um, that he'd already pioneered, even in his 20s um, in Pompeii. Another very famous figure in the history of Pompeian archaeology is the chap we see on the left there coming eye to eye with what looks like the marble bust of an emperor. 
His name was Amadeo Maiori, and he was the director of excavations at Pompeii, and indeed Herculaneum, for a good chunk of the 20th century. And for all of the pioneering work of, um, and the advancing of, of what uh, lessons he'd learned from Fiorelli and other directors before him, um, and uh, he generally regarded as, as a very positive light um, for uh, his systematic approaches to um, uh, Pompeian uh, archaeology and for the way he recorded and um, uh, certain parts of the site. Um, unfortunately, he, um, the, the downside is that he wasn't above occasionally, it seems, uh, manipulating some of the human remains he found um, in the buildings that he excavated to create a, a, a narrative um, perhaps that he wanted uh, told rather than um, what actually transpired in the final moments of, of some of those people's um, lives uh, in Pompeii. So we do have to treat some of his work with a little bit of caution for all of the um, great advantages that it has provided us with. On then to a particular house uh, within Pompeii, the very famous House of Menanda. And you can just see from those pictures, particularly the middle and the right hand side one there, just how grand um, and uh, wealthy um, this uh, building was, or rather the owners were. Um, on the right, there's a partially reconstructed atrium. You can see the uh, the sort of the, the, the rafters that form part of the impluvium at the top uh, and looks like a, a sort of a fountain um, effect at the bottom. Bright colours, big rooms, um, fairly uh, fairly stylish um, internal gardens there, courtyard gardens in the middle, um, albeit on the left-hand side you can see um, a fairly faceless sort of exterior um, presented to the street and, and that was by no means uncommon with some of the more grand houses in Pompeii it seems. Um, that they, uh, you know, what you saw on the outside certainly wasn't what you got on the inside. Uh, but it's in within the house of Menanda um, that uh, certain um, uh, manipulation, if we like, of material remains in the time of um, Maiori was carried out. I've adapted some of the information that you're about to, to hear just to try and create a slightly um, clearer picture um, of the, the mystery that you're trying to, to unpick. Um, from, from an archaeological point of view. Uh, but what you can see from this, um, from this diagram is just how sprawling the House of Menander was um, and um, uh, clearly how wealthy, perhaps how influential um, its owners uh, were. We're interested in particular in the uh, area, the section of this house indicated by the red circle. And actually within um, this circle, particularly rooms 19 and corridor L, 19 indicated by the green arrow pointing down, the corridor L, just outside it with the green arrow pointing left. This house was excavated in the period 26 to 1932 under the guidance of Amadeo Maiori. And it's in room 19 that he found um, three bodies, two large, one small, um, and a pick and a hoe um, with the bodies. These bodies were found stretched out 2.5 meters above ground level, i.e. above the level and that people would have been walking around the house when it was um, in, in business, as it were, um, on uh, layers of debris, uh, pumice, ash, and so on. In corridor L, he found another 10, and I've said smaller bodies, um, alongside a bronze lantern. The people in this group were at ground level and were essentially in a pile. What subsequently happened is that the three bodies were removed, for whatever reason, uh, from room 19 by um, Maiori's instruction, and the 10 bodies found in corridor L were subsequently placed inside room 19. Um, what Maiori said at the time, and has um, then since been proven to be the case, uh, looking at uh, the detailed notes he left, is that the attitudes, the positions of the bodies um, have been reproduced in room 19 as they were found in corridor L. Um, the pick and the hoe initially found with the bodies in room 19 uh, now with restored handles, uh, and the lantern were later placed with these bodies in room 19. On to your task then. Um, I've mentioned before that I've manipulated some of the data to try and make your job a little bit easier and a bit more clear, um, perhaps in so doing, um, ironically committing the very sin that we were talking about with regards to those early excavators at Pompeii. Um, but what I want you to do is to use the evidence and the information that you've um, seen on these slides and of course depending on how you're viewing this either on YouTube or as a Windows media file you can stop pause rewind and so on um, any of the evidence that, um, as you choose and also you might want to supplement um, some of the information with research um, carried out independently 
and come up with a story, a narrative that might explain the relationship between these two sets of bodies, the three found in room 19 and the 10 found just outside in Corridor L. And also, uh, as part of that explanation, um, you're gonna have to um, bring in the evidence uh, of the artifacts um, with which the bodies were found. And this is very much in keeping with the sort of the, the work that archeologists uh, do today. Of course, these archeology is um, it's a, a mute science. Um, very rarely do we get inscriptions or anything else that really gives us um, that kind of extra background about who these people were, what they were up to. Um, and uh, so that's your job. Good luck.